Well, welcome. We are, as you know, continuing our studies in the book of Acts, and this morning we are at Acts chapter 21. 21. Brings us to the last eight chapters of Acts. We are now three-fourths of the way through. I had entertained some thoughts uh, early this fall of being done with Acts by Christmas. Ain't going to happen, so... I'm not quite sure now when we will finish, but it'll be sometime probably uh, early February. That's uh, my best guess at the moment. We left Paul last week, you recall, at Miletus, where he had uh, summoned the uh, elders of the church in Ephesus for a brief final conversation. And we reviewed that conversation. We found Paul there uh, not only vindicating himself, that is, just expressing uh, the op- expressing to them the opportunity to kind of clear the decks if there were anything that uh, was, a, was any issue in anybody's mind. This was the time to raise it or forever hold their peace. It was a typical Hebraic kind of practice, and so Paul was doing something that uh, was certainly typical within that uh, Hebrew tradition, even though he was doing it in a Christian church. Secondly, he gives them what we call a charge, that is instructions, because this was a kind of passing of the mantle, The leadership of the church was now shifting from Paul, who had been their pastor for some three years, and he's leaving it now in the hands of these elders. And then finally, a commendation in which he relinquishes them into the care of God's grace. And so that's a kind of great moment for us, and it gives us a little insight into the uh, really passion that Paul had in ministry and the degree of attachment that his people would form to him. Nevertheless, Paul understood that this was probably the last time he would be there among the Ephesians. He was going back to Jerusalem, not certain what was going to befall him there, and so he wanted to make it clear that this was a time to uh, bring uh, some kind of uh, conclusion to that uh, time of ministry among the Ephesians. Now, from there, he's going to head back to Jerusalem. This will complete the third missionary journey. Uh, So we are reaching kind of an end of the... uh, uh, it's not only the end of this journey, but really the end of a major section of the book of Acts because uh, Luke has organized this third section around those three journeys. And so we're reaching the end of that and now moving to the last part of Acts in which Luke will organize his discussion around three trials. Uh, Paul is on trial three times. Again, this is partly Luke's desire to vindicate Paul by showing that every time he's tried, he's exonerated. And indeed, uh, it becomes an exoneration not only of Paul, but a vindication of the gospel in the process. So all of this ties together as Luke uh, weaves his story here. So we are today at uh, Acts 21, verse 1. I'm hopeful we'll make it to verse, uh, let's see, 26. Uh, I'm not certain about that, but we'll at least uh, uh, take a run at it. So we'll start at verse 1. This is page 141, if you have the Pew Bible there. Otherwise, uh, follow along in your own text. Uh, Acts 21, verse 1. When we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. When we found a ship bound for Phoenicia, we went on board and set sail. We came in sight of Cyprus, And leaving it on our left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, because the ship was to unload its cargo there. We looked up the disciples and stayed with them for seven days. Through the Spirit, they told Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we left and proceeded on our journey, and all of them with wives and children escorted us outside the city. There we knelt down on the beach and prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemais, and we greeted the believers and stayed with them for one day. The next day we left and came to Caesarea, and we went into the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. While we were staying there for several days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came to us and took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands with it, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, 
this is the way the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be bound, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Since he would not be persuaded, we remained silent, except to say, The Lord's will be done. After those days, we got ready and started to go up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also came along and brought us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to stay. When we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went in with us to visit James and all the elders who were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard it, they praised God. Then they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands of believers there are among the Jews, and they all are zealous for the law. They have been told about you, that you teach all the Jews living among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, and you tell them not to circumcise their children or to observe the customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Join these men, go through the rite of purification with them, and pay for the shaving of their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself observe and guard the law. But as for the Gentiles who have become believers, we've sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, having purified himself, he entered the temple with them, making public the completion of the days of purification when the sacrifice would be made for each of them. We're going to stop right there. There's a little sea change in the story that occurs right there, and so we'll uh, pick that up next time together. But uh, this has a lot of interesting detail to it, so we'll spend our time then reflecting on that text. Let's, uh, let's ask God's blessing on our time together. Our Father, we are grateful that again you have given us this beautiful day and this wonderful place in which to gather with your people. We pray that our reflection on this text would be guided by your Spirit so that our understanding of it would be accurate and faithful to those things that you wish to communicate to us. And we ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, back at uh, verse 21. Again, Paul, uh, uh, I should say Luke, Mr. Detail here, gives us the travel itinerary as they go along, uh, not missing a beat. Uh, He says, when they had parted from... Uh, from them, that is, from Miletus, from the Ephesian elders there at Miletus, we set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. Uh, If you have a little map there, you know that Kos is a little island just off the Turkish coast. Rhodes is a large island right at the corner, kind of the southwest corner of Turkey as you're in the Mediterranean there, and then Patara is a city right on the coast. So they just round the bend, heading back now towards Syria. And uh, verse 2, when we found a ship bound for Phoenicia, we went on board and set sail. Phoenicia is the uh, seacoast region where Tyre and Sidon are located. And of course, Paul will stop briefly in the city of Tyre, and so this is just giving us the general trajectory of their uh, travels here. When we came in sight of Cyprus, we left it on the left and we sailed to Syria, uh, landing at Tyre because the ship was to unload its cargo there. Uh, we might wonder why is Luke including this, and, and uh, I think the best uh, reason, especially people that lived at that time would appreciate, to sail past Cyrus, I'm sorry, Cyprus on the left meant they were making a straight course. This was somewhat unusual because normally the uh, weather could be somewhat more predictable out on the open sea of the Mediterranean. And it was very common to sail to the right, that is to the north of Cyprus, where you're in a more protected area. 
Uh, it seems to be suggestive that uh, the, the winds were good, the weather was great, and there was no reason not to just take a straight shot right across the open sea uh, from basically from Patera going right down there to uh, the coast of uh, Syria, uh, really to Phoenicia. And so uh, whatever more uh, significance you want to attach to that, I'll leave to your own creative juices. But uh, at least that seems to be uh, part of what's being said there. Uh, verse 4, then, we looked up the disciples and stayed there for seven days, that is, in the city of Tyre. Uh, we don't know when the church in Tyre was actually founded. Um, there's no reference to Paul having visited uh, Tyre. Uh, and so we gather that this must have just been Christian people who migrated there, and there's a church in, uh, in uh, existence in that city. Uh, Tyre is, of course, a very prominent city in the Old Testament. Uh, you may recall that David the king had a close relationship with the king of Tyre, whose name was Hiram. And uh, when David was contemplating uh, that his son would build a temple, it was from Tyre in Lebanon, really, that the uh, cedar uh, logs and so on were shipped down. Uh, Tyre was therefore tr uh, regarded warmly and uh, positively in a great deal of Old Testament description. However, at a certain point, the uh, city of Tyre and its king turned away from recognizing the God of Israel, the true God, and so the prophet Isaiah in uh, the late 8th century B.C. writes concerning Tyre that it would fall. And the fall of Tyre becomes a major theme that is uh, co uh, covered by Isaiah. Uh, and uh, that did take place about 150 years later when the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, laid siege for 13 years to Tyre. It eventually fell in 585, one year after the city of Jerusalem fell. But Isaiah also, interestingly, includes in his prophecy a rather unusual feature, and that is that even though Tyre would fall, Isaiah also provides a word of promise that at some time in the distant future, Tyre would be a center of the worship of the true God. And it's a, it's a rather remarkable thing. He doesn't always say such a thing, and yet in connection with Tyre in particular, he makes that uh, observation. And so many have looked at this reference to Tyre here in the New Testament and thought, well, this certainly does fit at least with what Isaiah had predicted. And really for some years afterwards, uh, into the second century, Tyre continued to be a, a strong Christian center. So we don't know how the church got started, but there it was. Uh, Paul knows there's a church there, and so upon arriving, he looks up these uh, disciples. He stays there for seven days. Uh, when our... Uh, through the Spirit, then again, verse 4, they uh, told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. We commented on that little uh, aspect of Paul's travels last week, that everywhere he went, he was being warned, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. You know, Paul kept wanting to go to Jerusalem. And it uh, raises this question, because we have this distinct impression that Paul was going to Jerusalem by the Spirit's direction. And yet these people are, by the Spirit, telling Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. You think, is the Spirit, you know, giving a mixed message here? What exactly do we, how do we account for this? Uh, go to Jerusalem, don't go to Jerusalem. Well, I want to comment on that this morning, but I'm saving it because it comes into its sharpest relief in connection with Agabus, as you recall, just a few minutes later. So we're going to hold that little question in suspension but we will come back to it in a moment. So verse 5, When our days there were ended, that is entire, we left and proceeded on our journey, and all of them with wives and children escorted us outside the city. There we knelt down on the beach and prayed and said farewell to one another. A very touching, very Christian setting. Here are all these Christian people with their children, you know, just picture that. They all go down to the seashore. Uh, they're there on the sandy beach, and they all kneel down and pray. They don't care who sees them. They don't mind being right out in the public. And they give this public uh, exhibition, really, of their faith in God and entrusting Paul into the care of God in this very touching and warm sort of way. And so it's a, it's a very Christian setting here, and I think we can all imagine such a thing. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. So, so much for Tyre. Then uh, verse 7, when we finished the voyage from Tyre, we reached Ptolemais. And there we greeted the believers and stayed with them for one day. 
Uh, Ptolemaeus is a little south of Tyre, right on the seashore, so obviously Paul was on the ship and they just came to the next port uh, along the way. Ptolemaeus was named, of course, for Ptolemy, the dynasty of Egypt that had taken over after the death of Alexander the Great. The city Ptolemaeus itself had its name changed, and in the Middle Ages it was called Acre, A-C-E-R. Uh, if you know the uh, story of the Crusades, you know that Acre was a major uh, kind of beachhead for the Crusaders. Uh, so they landed at this very location. Uh, Richard the Lionhearted and various others actually established a kind of outpost there, and from there they launched their various campaigns to try to retake Jerusalem, which isn't all that far away. So Ptolemaeus has some interesting history, subsequent, of course, to our New Testament uh, interest in it. But uh, anyway, it's the same city, Ptolemaeus, a.k.a. Acre. Uh, stayed there for one day, and then verse 8, the next day we left and came to Caesarea, and we went into the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven, and stayed with him. So now we're in Caesarea. These are, this is familiar real estate. Uh, Caesarea, we've, uh, we've been there before in the book of Acts. This is where Cornelius resided, and from, which, uh, from whence he had sent for Peter in Joppa, and the conversion of Cornelius took place in Caesarea. That was in chapters 10 and 11 of uh, the book of Acts, so that should ring some bells for those of you who were in the class uh, last week, or last year, actually, last year. And uh, from there, they go to the house of Philip. Another little review point. Um, Philip, of course, also has played prominently in Acts. We encountered this character back in chapter 6. Uh, he's said here to be one of the seven uh, you recall that there was a little controversy, a little squabble in the early days of the church concerning the ministration of food to the Greek-speaking Jewish widows. And the apostles were being regaled with complaints about the fact that these women were being neglected in the daily service of the food. And the apostles were saying, well, look, this is important, but I think our calling is a little different than to wait on tables. And so why don't you go select seven qualified people to care for this problem? The church numbered several thousand, so you can imagine these seven were quite uh, prominent people and, and uh, well-qualified. And of them, one was Stephen, who was the first Christian martyr. We learned his story in chapter 7. Another was Philip. And so Philip is said to be one of the seven. This all took place about 20 years earlier, you see. So we're way back in the early chapters of Acts here. Uh, Philip was also the one who had first carried the gospel to a non-strictly Jewish audience. So if you recall chapter 8 of Acts, it was Philip who was on this rather controversial mission to Samaria. And that whole story we reviewed way back then. It was also Philip who took the gospel to the first full Gentile, albeit a Jewish proselyte Gentile. That was the Ethiopian eunuch. So all of that was uh, part of Philip's role, and he had a fairly prominent play. And then he passes off the radar screen, and we haven't had much uh, contact with him whatsoever. In fact, no mention of him until now. Uh, and the impression is that, that uh, sometime, probably fairly soon after the incident with the Ethiopian eunuch, he went to Caesarea, presumably married. He has these four daughters that we hear of now at, uh, in the ensuing verses. So we are at uh, Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He stayed with them. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. So Philip has four uh, young daughters. Well, we don't know if they're young, but they're said to be unmarried. The way that... Um, the way that Luke expresses this, there are four virgin daughters is the term he uses. And it's a rather peculiar way of describing them such that some commentators have, have seen within this, and probably with some good reason, that these, these women were not unmarried simply because they were young and waiting for Mr. Wright to show up, you know, and pop the question. It wasn't uh, that, but they really were probably unmarried as a conscious decision. That is, that they had elected to pursue a celibate life. And the very way that uh, Luke kind of peculiarly expresses that, especially in the Greek, suggests that this was actually a life mission, as it were. If that's the case, then they might even be something like a proto-nun. You know. Now, I'm not a Catholic, I suppose so most of you aren't either, but there does seem to be a place, biblically, for the person who opts for a celibate life. 
Um, uh, you may recall Jesus himself when he talks about marriage and uh, divorce, and he, he talks about a category of people who are celibate by choice. And, he, and, and such people have a kind of flexibility that, uh, you know, those of us who have families and so on don't uh, have at the same, with the same degree of, of uh, latitude. And so uh, there's an idea in the New Testament that people may be called by God to a single life and that that is, in fact, something that sort of releases them to have a more uh, sort of a flexible approach. They can do more things, go more places. They're not uh, tied down, as it were, by a family. The biblical understanding generally assumes marriage and family, but always allows the exception, and the exception here seems to be where we find these four uh, unmarried daughters of Philip, that this was more than just young maidens, uh, that this was something a little bit more uh, of a lifetime, uh, lifetime kind of commitment, uh, presumably. Uh, they also were said here to have the gift of prophecy, the gift of prophecy. Uh, now, we've talked a little bit at other times about uh, the notion that there is in this first generation of the Christian church, somewhat unusual and rather remarkable supernatural gifts that God gives. Now, there's, a, there's an abiding controversy, as you know, about whether the church continues to have a gift of prophecy or a gift of tongues or that sort of thing, and I'm not wanting to get off on that at all here, but just simply to mention that there does seem to be a kind of supernatural quality, that this is more than prophecy in the simple sense of preaching or proclaiming. Some kind of additional quality seems to be included here. The classical view has been that God gave special gifts to the church in its first generation because the first generation was unique in the history of the church. This was a time of building. This was a time in which the church was kind of getting on its feet. It was still, in a sense, under the umbrella of Judaism, that there was still a tie between the two. Not until Jerusalem actually fell is the church uh, moving out, as it were, into subsequent history. Even early historians seem to regard that first generation as affirmatively unique in the history of the church. And as early as the second century, we hear them describing how some of these supernatural gifts are beginning to become less pronounced in the life of the church. So that probably is the kind of thing we're talking about here, that these women had this gift of prophecy, and it probably falls within that category of a kind of unique uh, expression of supernatural giftedness belonging to that early day in the life of the church, but maybe not part of the ongoing uh, life of the church throughout the ages. Now, I realize some of you in here sharply disagree with me. On that point, I know that, so I'm not trying to just gloss over a lively debate or a legitimate uh, alternative view. I'm just saying this is kind of the traditional view, and I think you'll at least allow that that's probably the case. What's also intriguing here is that these are four women, and they have the gift of prophecy. And Paul, of course, uh, contemplates that women will use their gifts in the church. He talks in 1 Corinthians 10 about women praying and prophesying in the church. But it's the same Paul who also says, I instruct that women keep silent in the church. You can't believe I'm getting into this one, can you? But, uh, that, and I'm not. Actually, I'm not. I just, I'm just going to mention in passing that, uh, you know, you do have another lively debate here that has continued and does continue to this day as to what exactly is the legitimate role of women in the church. Women's ordination and all sorts of things, of course, spin out of this conversation. Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to jump into that when it's really well beside the point of our immediate text, but simply to say, this is one text that at least needs to be added to the mix. These are four women, they prophesy, and prophecy legitimately happens in the church, therefore they, they prophesied in the church, and so whatever Paul meant about women keeping silent, this was not obviously an absolute rule. It may have been an occasional rule for the Corinthians because the Corinthians were under a certain kind of immediate uh, influence that uh, necessitated such a principle. Again, I know there are people in this room that have sharp disagreements with me on this one, so I, I know you're out there. I'm just uh, touching this in passing. I'm not even taking a position here, am I? I'm just glossing over it, mentioning it, and moving on. Uh, fleet of what? Uh, okay, verse 10. While we were staying there for several days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Again, Agabus is a guy we've, um, we've run into before. This is a great kind of uh, homecoming here. We're meeting all these folks that 
uh, reviewing these things that have happened before. But Agabus, you remember back in chapter 11 of Acts, was the one who showed up at Caesarea and in Caesarea had predicted a great famine that would come across the land. And Luke advises us that that famine did, did indeed occur during the reign of Claudius. Claudius came to the throne of Rome in 41. The, 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 uh, the uh, famine was probably about 43, 44, 45. That is what precipitated Paul's so-called famine visit uh, to Jerusalem that he probably, that's probably what he's mentioning in Galatians 1 and 2. That's the same Agabus. This is all about 20 years earlier, so now we have Agabus, a little more gray hair probably, but still in the prophecy biz. And he shows up now at Caesarea and uh, does the following. He came to us and took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands with it, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit... This is the way the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. So Agabus engages in what's called the genre of the prophetic object lesson. Very common in the Old Testament. You don't see quite so much of it in the New but it's, uh, it's certainly something that uh, uh, would be recognizable. Uh, and it's the idea that a prophet would sometimes not simply announce a message or even write a message, but when it, would, in a sense, act a message. And there'd be kind of skits or object lessons, antics that uh, prophets would go through. And you see this very commonly in the Old Testament. Isaiah does this, Ezekiel does this, Hosea in a very graphic kind of way, does this, and uh, various other prophets will actually play act in some sort of public way the content of their message and then comment on what they've done. You know, And so this is not an unusual thing. Here, Agabus is doing that very sort of thing. He shows up, he takes the sash, the belt, uh, otherwise the, the girdle it's sometimes called. It's a, it's a kind of a long uh, cloth that would be used to, to uh, kind of wrap up these flowing uh, garments that they wore in the first century. And so Agabus takes this belt or this sash and he ties himself up in it very dramatically. And then he says, the man who owns this belt is going to be tied up just like I am when he gets to Jerusalem and uh, he's going to be imprisoned and treated badly. And so uh, that's the message here. And obviously Paul was the owner of the belt. And that, of course, led all the people that were there with Paul to reasonably uh, conclude, as, as we hear in verse 12, when we heard this, we and the people there urged him, pleaded with him, Paul, would you get a clue? You know, don't go to Jerusalem. Uh, so now this sort of brings into sharp relief this whole question that we've been toying with. Paul believes he is called to go to Jerusalem. He believes God's Spirit is driving him to Jerusalem. This is his finish line. He feels that he will have manifestly fumbled the ball of that which God entrusted to him through Christ if he does not go to Jerusalem. He's very much like Jesus in this respect, who set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. Paul has something like that, it seems, going on and believes very much that God is driving him in that direction. Notwithstanding all that, everywhere Paul goes... People, moved by the same spirit, are warning him what, what will befall him in Jerusalem and urging him on the basis of that, don't go to Jerusalem. And again, it poses this question in our minds, uh, you know, what's the Holy Spirit trying to do here? What kind of confused message is this? I believe the best resolution of this is simply to put it this way. These people who are getting these messages from the Holy Spirit are getting absolutely accurate information. The information is absolutely correct, but they are mistaken in their application of it. That is, the way in which they're actually trying to apply it in Paul's life is misguided. This is no fault on the part of whether they've heard it correctly. It's simply the fact that they are leaping to conclusions that are not warranted. It's not part of the Spirit's message that Paul should not go to Jerusalem. It's simply the message, when Paul does go to Jerusalem, here's what's going to happen. They're making a very human judgment. Therefore, Paul, get a clue. You know, don't go to Jerusalem. But Paul understands that uh, this is not so much 
to dissuade him from going to Jerusalem, but just give him a heads up. Here's what's awaiting you when you get there. Uh, it's something like, and indeed I think there's a more than a, a subtle parallel between this moment in Paul's life and a similar thing that happened when Jesus himself was setting his face to go to Jerusalem. Uh, at the Caesarea Philippi Confession, you may recall, uh, Jesus took the disciples to that city, not Caesarea, the different location, Caesarea Philippi, which was a Gentile city. And this is recorded in, Ma- in Matthew uh, 16. Jesus takes the disciples there. The place is swirling with a kind of cosmopolitan atmosphere. There's a shrine there, for example, that's been there for many years, celebrating all the great religions of the world. Jesus has taken the disciples on a field trip. The master tutor, rabbi, teacher, has taken them now to a place where he wants to instruct them in a fundamental question of uh, Bible truth, and so he takes them here and begins to ask them the question, well, who do people say that I am? You know, we see there's Plato, and there's the Greek god Athena, and here we've got, you know, somebody else, and who do people say that I am? He raises that question while they've got their minds full of sort of this uh, pagan, cosmopolitan, international uh, kind of information, and so they respond, well, you know, some people say you're a great teacher, Some people say you're a wonderful moral example. Some people say you're one of the prophets of old. Some people say you're this. Some people say you're that. All thinking that they're really congratulating, tipping their hats to Jesus. And then he cuts to the chase. But who do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, speaking for everybody else, presumably. Well, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You're the long-expected one. You're the one that all history up till this time has been anticipating. You're the one. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus congratulates Peter at that point, pronounces one of the most striking blessings that anybody ever heard from the lips of Jesus. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. Peter, you didn't get this because you are just a native intelligence and you were able to see through to this deep insight concerning my identity. Or you didn't get this because you're just one of those rare religious geniuses that comes along in history a, hundred, a few hundred years uh, you know, in between them and recognized who I am. Or Peter, you didn't get this because you graduated from you know, Jerusalem University with a Ph.D. in philosophy and that's how you figured out who I am. Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, he says, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter, the information that you have just expressed reflects nothing less than supernatural revelation from no one less than God himself. That's how that information got into your skull. And because of that, you are blessed. And beyond that, I say you are are now uh, Peter. You're the rock. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church and the very defensive gates of hell won't be able to to withstand the onslaught of this church. It'll knock them down. It's going to invade the devil's territory. You see, this is... Well, it doesn't get much better than that. I mean, Peter is pretty full of excitement over that particular pronouncement. And uh, then Jesus begins, and this is the critical point, to explain what it means to say that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. What does that mean? How do we apply it? Jesus says, okay, here's what it means. I must go to Jerusalem. Just as Paul was driven to Jerusalem. I must go to Jerusalem, Jesus says. It's impossible for a prophet to die, save in Jerusalem. I've got to go to Jerusalem. But in Jerusalem, I will be uh, handed over to the scribes, the chief priests. They're going to... uh, Uh, assault me, they'll hand me over to the Gentiles, I will be mistreated, I'll be vilified, I'll eventually be crucified, and I'll die there. You see. Now, Peter isn't liking this. Peter walks over, grabs Jesus by the nap of the neck, you know, drags him over to a little secluded place and says, wait a minute, didn't you hear what I said? I said you're the Christ. I mean, what part of this don't you understand? Do I have to spoon feed everything to you, Jesus? What's the problem? Let's go through it again. From the t- I said you're the Christ, don't you? That means you're the man. You're the king. You're the number one. You're the guy. 
You know, what's this nonsense about going to Jerusalem, crucified? No, 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 no. Jesus, please. Can't you get this? Patronizing Peter, you know, trying to explain everything to Jesus. Slow study, but he thinks maybe if he just rebukes him enough, Jesus will get it. The amazing thing, I, I just wonder what Peter went through, because the same guy who had just heard this most astonishing benediction, now here's probably the most severe rebuke that anybody ever heard from the lips of Jesus. All within about five minutes, you know. I mean, what kind of roller coaster is that, do you imagine? So the same Jesus who had just said that Peter was the rock now says, you get behind me, Satan. You get out of my face. You are a devil. Get out of my way. You see, It doesn't get much worse than that. You are no longer expressing the truth of God. You are now simply expressing the wisdom of man. That's really the kind of thing that was happening here in Caesarea. Uh, these people had gotten perfectly accurate information from the Spirit concerning what was going to befall Paul in Jerusalem. They didn't have a clue what it meant. They thought it meant, so Paul, duh, don't go to Jerusalem. You know, this is kind of a no-brainer, isn't it? Uh, the Spirit says if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be persecuted and possibly even killed, so... Hey, let's take a day off. What do you say? Let's do something else. And Paul is saying, yeah, 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 I know that's what the Spirit is saying, but you are misapplying the truth. You got the right information. You're going the wrong direction with it, just the same way Peter did when he was there at Caesarea Philippi. So Paul, patiently, hearing all of this, then responds to them in verse 12. When we heard this, uh, well, verse 12, the people all urged him not to go. Luke includes himself very modestly. He was one of the ones, you see, who was trying to talk Paul out of going. And then Paul responds and says, verse 13, Then Paul answered, What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart for crying out loud. <laughs> you can imagine Paul's got tears coming down his face. He's so moved by these people trying to talk him out of going to Jerusalem. But he says, Don't you know I'm ready not only to be bound, but to even die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Don't you understand? This is where I must go. This is the end of the line. This is the journey. This is the destiny that I have. And again, it takes us back to Caesarea Philippi. This, these are almost parallel events. Jesus and Paul. Jesus in Caesarea Philippi, Paul in Caesarea. Not the same city, but even that's kind of similar. Jesus said to his disciples... After he had rebuked Peter, he says these words. He says, okay, now, if anyone wants to be my disciple, then you take up your cross and follow me. And the person who seeks to hang on to his life will certainly lose it. But the person who's prepared to relinquish his life for my sake will find it. Brutal irony. We have tended to spiritualize that text. Uh, you know, Jesus says, take up the cross and follow me. And we sort of missed the point there. In the first century, when Jesus said that to the disciples, they didn't have 2,000 years of church history, which has sort of turned the cross into a Christian symbol, you know. They just saw it as a brutal means of execution. And so for Jesus to say, take up your cross and follow me, was about the same. I suppose we would hear it about the same way if Jesus had said, if you want to be my disciple, take a long rope, form it into a noose, tie the noose around your neck, and follow me with the tail of the rope following behind you, and let's go to Jerusalem, as if you are going to your death. You're going to be hung. And you're almost inviting anyone that finds you to just string you up, you see. Uh, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. This is the Christian standard, that we have relinquished our claim to ourselves up to and including our own lives into the care of Christ. We count ourselves, Paul says, to be dead men for the sake of Christ. There's a lot of liberty in that. That really takes a big burden off, you see. Because if you consider yourself a dead man, then anything less than that is really kind of more than you expected. You see, it's really... Sort of, and so that's the, that's the idea, is that we as Christian people have just surrendered ourselves into the care of Christ, and we're prepared to even die for him. That's what Paul says here. You folks, you want me to try to save my life. 
As if my life were something I were worried about. I count my life as not of any worth to me if I can just realize that for which Christ has placed his hand upon me. And for me, at this point, that means go to Jerusalem, where I'm prepared to die. I'm prepared to die, just as uh, Jesus had said to his disciples. So, verse 14, since he would not be persuaded, hard-headed, Paul, we remain silent, except to say, okay, okay, the Lord's will be done. That's kind of what you, that's your last ditch prayer, you know, the Lord's will, when nothing else has worked, that's always a safe prayer. And it is, it's a good prayer. The Lord's will be done. That's, a, that's always a good prayer. You're always on safe ground by praying the Lord's will be done. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. <laughs> See, that's okay. That makes it right up there in the Lord's prayer. And so uh, the people here are not just simply kind of flaking out or caving in with a sort of uh, despondent resignation, uh, kind of a fatalistic attitude, but they actually, this is a very good prayer for them to pray. Okay, Paul, you win. The Lord's will be done. After these days, we got ready and started to go up to Jerusalem. Caesarea is almost uh, uh, just a little north and west of Jerusalem, so this is the inland route now toward that city. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also came along and brought us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, presumably in Jerusalem, uh, an early disciple with whom we were to stay. Uh, the term early disciple there, the Greek word, is actually uh, the word ancient disciple. Nason was an ancient disciple, which might mean he was just really old, but uh, probably uh, the, the idea more is this. Uh, that was a term that may have been used to describe people that were actually disciples of Jesus when Jesus was actually here on earth. That uh, obviously some people who came into the Christian church had been followers of Jesus before his crucifixion. He had disciples, many of them. And we assume many of them became Christian believers. There's you know, every reason to think that. And so it may be that Nason is uh, one of those who went clear back, had roots clear back in that very early time. All right. Uh, when we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers welcomed us warmly. All right. Just put a little mental note here at this verse. Verse 17 marks the end of the third missionary journey. He's back to Jerusalem. It also marks the end of the third major section of the book of Acts. So even though there's no chapter division there... Uh, we're kind of making a little jump now to the last major section of Acts. Uh, you recall Acts is in four major segments. The first segment organized around three great sermons in Jerusalem. The second segment organized around three great conversions, building a bridge from Jerusalem to the non-Jewish people. The third section, three great journeys, building a bridge from Jerusalem to the world geographically. And Paul, of course, is the center of that discussion. Now the last part of Acts, three great trials. Paul is on trial three times, and uh, each time becomes an opportunity for Paul to uh, defend himself and at the same time for Luke to convey to us the defense of Paul and the defense of Paul's gospel. And so this is a very high, a tightly organized book, and we're just now making the little leap now, as it were, uh, into the last section of the book. And we're seeing the build-up now to the first trial uh, that begins to unfold before us. So he arrives in Jerusalem. The brothers, Christian brothers, welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went with us to visit James. And all the elders were present. James appears to be the leader, the, the pastor, if you will, the bishop of the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem at this time is the flagship church of the entire church. Uh, Jerusalem has not been destroyed yet. This is the center of the Christian universe. And James is the leader of this church. Uh, now, I'm saying this for the sake of the ongoing debate I have with a couple of my Catholic friends, that Peter is nowhere to be found here. It's, it's James is uh, running the church. I know you've got a good answer for that out there, but nevertheless, I uh, just have to score points when I can as a faithful Protestant. So uh, here we are. James is the leader, the, the chair, if you will, of this, uh, of this gathering. 
After greeting them, he, that is Paul, related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Paul, or Luke is setting up now the issue. It's going to be the Gentile Jew issue. And so he wants to get us thinking about that. And so what Paul, what Paul has done is related now what God had done among the Gentiles. He's been gone about five years. You know, He was three years in Ephesus. It was another year after that, and then the time it took to get there in the first place. So, you know, four and a half, five years he's been gone. So this is a lot of information, and Paul probably took his time and delineated in some detail all that had taken place during this uh, extended uh, time on the third journey. Verse 20, when they heard it, they praised God. This is no negative reception. They're very happy. But now comes the other side of the issue. This is where we begin to see the little dark cloud on the horizon. Uh, James says, You see, brother, Paul, how many thousands of believers there are among the Jews. And they are all zealous for the law, meaning the Jewish law. You see. As we've said before, at this time, the Christian church is on two different pages. You've got the Jewish page and the Gentile page. The people who were converted to the Christian faith out of their Jewish religious tradition simply became vastly better Jewish practitioners. They did not abandon their Jewish practice. They, in fact, saw this as the great consummation of all the things that they had done. But they continued to be active in their participation of the life in the temple. And as James says here, they become uh, zealous for the law. The question had always been, do we require the same thing from the Gentiles? If a Gentile person wants in, do we say, okay, you've got to become zealous for the law. You've got to become, in effect, a good Jew before you can be a good Christian. Is that the door by which you are going to gain access to the Messianic benefits? Answer... No. The Jerusalem Council squabbles over that, reaches the decision that only a very minimal standard is going to be imposed on the Gentiles at the point of Jewish issues. Things strangled, drinking blood, things that would be highly offensive to their Jewish comrades in the church are going to be, they're going to be asked to avoid those, but they're certainly not going to be asked to engage in circumcision, dietary regulations, all kinds of uh, holy days and so on that are the intricacies of Jewish practice. No, 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 none of that. So the church is really moving on two tracks here, and it creates a little bit of tension. And it's the tension that's now beginning to be brought uh, uh, into our focus. So you see, brothers, how many of the uh, Jewish people, and they're all zealous for the law, they have been told about you, that you teach all the Jews living among the Gentiles to forsake Moses and tell them not to circumcise their children or to observe the customs. In other words, Paul, you have been treated to highly slanderous, false information concerning your ministry. Because Paul didn't go around telling Jewish people not to circumcise their kids. He wasn't telling Jewish people to forsake Moses. He was telling Gentile people they did not need to uh, you know, uh, take on these responsibilities in order to come within the Christian church. But Paul, you know, as, as rumor has it, uh, rumors tend to get exaggerated, distorted, stretched out of all proportion, and that's exactly what had happened to Paul. Uh, well, this is an awkward place to start. I, uh, stop. I, ho I hope that you are just on the edge of your chairs with wondering, how is this going to turn out? Wow, this is really exciting. I hope that you're thinking that because we're going to have to stop right here and see how this plays out. And it does play out in a wonderful sermon and in, in indeed a kind of trial now that Paul has uh, here uh, right off the bat. Uh, so we'll stop at that point. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. We'll... Father, we're grateful that you have continued to give us this privilege of studying your word. We thank you in particular for the uh, uh, encouragement that comes to us as we see how Paul set his face to go to Jerusalem, Jesus the same way, going to Jerusalem. We pray that we would have similar courage in whatever you've called us to do, to be people of integrity who respond to your call, whatever it may mean, in such a way that you are honored thereby. We give you thanks for it and ask your blessing on us now in the name of Christ.